Hello everyone, welcome to my new series of epilepsy educational videos and our first ever long form episode on epilepsy. If you're new here, this is not one of my quick neurology explainers. Instead, this is something different. It's soft, it's unhurried, and it's designed to help you unwind and rest while learning deeply about epilepsy. So whether you're driving, relaxing in your backyard, or using this as a gentle sleep aid, I invite you to get comfortable, slow down your breath, and join me as I gently walk through what I learned from chapter six of Willie's treatment of epilepsy titled Neurophysiology and the EEG. Let's begin. What I learned about field potentials. So much of what we see in EEGs, those squiggly lines tracing across the screen, is rooted in something called field potentials. These are the electrical ripples that occur in the space around brain cells. When these ripples are fast, we recognize them as traditional EEG waves. When they're slower or more sustained, they're part of what's called a direct current or DC potential. Now here's something that stood out to me. Field potentials are essential not just for identifying seizures, but also for classifying them and evaluating how well seizure treatments are working. It's like looking at the sea, not just to tell if a storm is coming, but also to understand what kind of storm it is and whether your boat will weather it. Section one, the players, neurons and glial cells. The brain's electrical activity is shaped by two main types of cells, neurons and glial cells. Picture a thick forest where branches from different trees all intertwine. That's kind of how these cells are arranged, a dense, intricate mesh of wires and support beams. A neuron, the main communicator, has a cell body, dendrites, and an axon. Think of dendrites like tiny tree branches that receive signals and axons like long roads that carry messages outward. These messages travel through spikes in voltage called action potentials, and they get passed along through chemical messengers at the synapse. What's really fascinating is how tiny voltage changes called postsynaptic potentials either make the next neuron more likely to fire, excitatory, or less likely, inhibitory. And when you get enough of these excitatory signals happening quickly, or at the same time in different places, you can actually create a new action potential. This summation, both over time and space, is how the brain builds up to making decisions, taking actions, or sometimes generating seizures. Section two, the role of glial cells. Now, glial cells don't fire off action potentials like neurons do, but they're not just passive bystanders. They help regulate the environment around neurons, especially the potassium levels outside the cells. Imagine you're at a concert and someone starts shouting. If everyone starts shouting too, it turns into a chaotic wave. Glial cells help manage that by soaking up the extra noise, or in this case, Potassium ions. When neurons fire rapidly, they release potassium and glial cells respond by depolarizing, changing their own electrical state. This interaction shapes the electrical field around neurons, especially when there's a lot of firing happening, like during seizures. Section three, how field potentials are made. Here's a cool visual that stuck with me. Imagine a vertically oriented neuron, like a long cactus, and the excitatory signal lands on the upper part of it, causing a rush of positively charged ions to flow into the cell. This sets up a current both inside and outside the neuron. If you were to place one electrode near the top of this cactus-like neuron and one lower down, the top would see a negativity due to the inward ion flow, while the bottom might see a positivity. Between those points lies a reversal zone, 
kind of like the neutral ground between opposing teams. This spread of voltage is what generates the field potential that we detect in EEGs. Why position matters. Another thing I learned is how the orientation of neurons affects whether we can detect their activity at all. When neurons are aligned in a parallel fashion, like soldiers in formation, field potentials are clear and strong. But when they're scattered like a crowd at a festival, their individual currents cancel each other out. This is the difference between open and closed fields. The cortex, with its neat layered layout, creates open fields. That's why we can detect cortical activity so well with EEG, deeper structures like the brainstem often form closed fields, making their activity harder to pick up. AC versus DC in EEG. Most EEGs are recorded in alternating current or AC mode. That's where we see the classic wavy EEG lines. But if we use direct current or DC recording, we can capture slower, broader changes called baseline shifts. For example, if a neuron is firing in bursts, the membrane potential might shift gradually. With DC recordings, you can actually see that slow shift in the baseline. And these shifts are especially important in epilepsy because they can mark the onset of a seizure before the classic EEG waves even show up. Seizure-related field potentials. One of the most fascinating insights from this chapter is how the brain's electrical signature changes during a seizure. As an epileptic focus develops, neurons show something called paroxysmal depolarizations, a steep voltage change followed by a burst of spikes and then a recovery. These patterns, when synchronized across many neurons, create sharp waves on the EEG What's wild is that even areas near the epileptic focus, but not generating seizures themselves, can pick up and echo this activity. These are called epileptic evoked potentials. It's like hearing echoes from a nearby explosion. You're not at the epicenter, but you still feel the shock wave. When surface EEG doesn't tell the full story, in motor cortex seizures, field potentials on the scalp EEG don't always match up with what the deeper brain layers are doing. Sometimes the outward appearance looks calm, even though the deep layers are bursting with activity and sending signals down to the spinal cord that result in muscle clonus. This really emphasizes why depth electrodes or intracranial recordings are sometimes necessary to localize epileptic foci for surgical evaluation. Section four, generalized seizures, tonic-clonic waves. During generalized tonic-clonic seizures, the brain shows both baseline shifts and rapid waves. The tonic phase, when the muscles stiffen, corresponds with sustained depolarization, while the clonic phase, when jerking begins, comes with rhythmic discharges. In experimental models, these seizures start with a negative baseline shift deep in the cortex, and this activity climbs to the surface. But again, the surface EEG might not show the whole picture. Deep recordings, especially in layer five of the cortex, give us more accurate correlations with motor output. Spreading depression and epileptic activity. This chapter ends with an interesting discussion of spreading depression, a wave of silencing that moves across the brain. It starts with a burst of activity, then shuts down neuronal firing and finally enters a hyper excitable phase. This phenomenon plays a role in epilepsy and stroke and seems to lower the brain's threshold for seizures. One interesting detail, when GABAergic inhibition, our brain's main braking system, is weakened, spreading depression can trigger seizures. That gives us clues about how important inhibition is in controlling excitability and how delicate that balance really is. Section five, conclusion. 
what I learned from chapter six is that the EEG is more than just waves on a screen. It's a window into the shifting sea of currents between and around brain cells, especially neurons, but also glial cells. The generation of field potentials is tied to the movement of ions, the architecture of the brain, and the timing of inputs and inhibition. Field potentials help us detect, classify, and understand seizures, and they even help us guide treatments and predict outcomes from surgery. But they also reveal how complex and subtle the brain really is. Sometimes what we see on the surface doesn't match what's happening below. And that's it folks, thanks for watching. And I'll see you in the next calming long form video on the book, Willie's Treatment of Epilepsy.